Our speaker for today's session is Professor Nana Meyer, CNRC Research Director in Verata at the Center for European Studies and Comparative Politics of Science, former chair of the French Political Science Association between 2005 and 2016, and a member of the National Consultative Commission for Human Rights since 2017. Her recent publication include Political Science Approaches to the Far Right, uh, Researching the Far Right, Routledge 2020, The Radical Right in France, The Oxford Handbook of the Radical Right, and The Impact of Gender on Marine Le Pen Vote. Um, the lecture's title today is From Le Pen to Zemmour, Radical Right Populism in France. The populism radical right has been thriving in Europe and beyond over the last three decades. The French Front National today renamed Rassemblement National, the National Rally, is one of the oldest and the most successful of them. Since Marine Le Pen took over, succeeding her father in 2011, the RN has reached unprecedented electoral scores. Yet, she's challenged today by a new contender on the right, Eric Zemmour. A close study of the French case on the eve of 2022 presidential election shows clearly what these right-wingers have in common, what they stand for, who vote for them, and what are the short and the long-term factors explain their success or their failure, and to what extent they are a threat for democracy. Uh, the floor is yours, Professor Nana, to give your speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this exciting uh, winter school. My only regret is to be in rainy and cold Paris and not with you in Doha. So I'm going to try and make the PowerPoint work. So that's going to be the test. And uh, one second. Do you see it? Yes, perfect. OK, and does it work? Okay, so that's one good thing. Uh, I'm going to speak, as you said, um, of the French National Front, ex-National Front, now National Rally, and of the challenge between uh, Marine Le Pen, Eric Zemmour, and uh, the other candidates in these elections. So populism is a very fashionable and controversial context, con uh, a topic. Every day you have a new book, article, paper on it, and even at Sciences Po, where I work, you have more than 30 people currently working on the topic, and there are unending debates. But there is an infinite variety of populism, and what I'll try to do is use the French case as a magnifying glass of one nice case, because it's a very successful radical right populist party, and from that we'll try to compare. So, to tell you that there is an infinite variety of cases, here is the core of the, uh, the group of these radical rights in the European Parliament. You have Marine Le Pen, you have the, the, the Dutch, you have the, the Belgium, uh, you have the Austrian. But you also have left-wing populism in Spain, in Greece, in France, in Italy. You have uh, specific post-communist countries populism. And you have today, all over the world, populism from uh, India, Pakistan, Philippines, Indonesia. So it's a complicated topic, and I'll concentrate on what I know best, which is the French national rally. I'll concentrate and compare it to other populist radical rights in the European Union, and mostly Western Union, in the old established democracies. And in a social science perspective, Let's go back to the philosopher Spinoza, Spinoza. I have striven not to laugh at human actions, not to weep at them, not to hate them, but to understand them. So that's what we're going to try and do on that very controversial and sensitive and passionate uh, issue. So uh, what I'll do is two points. What is populism, particularly radical right populism? And what does the French case teach us from Le Pen to Zemmour, and I'll finish on the challenge it represents to democracy and to the other parties that face it. So history, definition, audience, and causes, that will be the first part of the conference. Um, those who have attended the other sessions of this winter school have heard of the origins of populism in Russia, 
with the Narodniki movements, intellectuals that were idealizing the peasants. And you've also heard of the unending strand of literature that you have on populism since 1969 in UNESCO and Gellner. And there have been several waves in post-war Europe. And today there is a kind of agreement on a deficient, a minimalist definition given by the researchers Kass Mudder and Cristobal Kaltwasser. And they consider that the minimal definition we can give of populism is ideational, via their ideology, their ideas, and their world vision. And that's what they call a thin-centered ideology, very, very minimal, very malleable, that can be hosted by many other thicker ideologies. So you need to qualify. Just saying populism means nothing. There's populism everywhere, on the left, the right, the center. So I, their definition, which you probably know, is that uh, populism has a dichotomous view of the world. It separates society in two groups, the pure people versus the corrupt elites, and that can fit in any country. They argue that it's a moral dichotomy. They're on the side of the good against the evil, and they argue that Politics should always be only the expression of the general will of the people. That means that the mediation, what we call representative democracy, they just push away. It's a direct dialogue between the leader and the people. But what I'd be more interested in is radical right populism. And there again, Kasmude proposes to give a three element definition. It's nativism, a mixture of xenophobia and nationalism, it's authoritarianism, the hard way, the tough way, and it's populism, as we saw. And that's maybe a very nice summary, that cartoon, of what is nativism. It's the Swiss populist radical right, it was in 2007 or 2008, and it shows exactly the essence of nativism. We are the white sheep in our field, and they kick out what they consider the black sheep. It's us and them. And there again, that can fit, fit in any society. But in Europe, there has been a spectacular rise of populism since uh, the 90s. They said that there was a very nice paper in The, the Guardian saying that uh, in 2018, one in four European today is vote populist, multiplied by three in 20 years. In a dozen European nations, populist parties have entered government. In countries like Hungary or Poland, they rule. And there again, they have a very nice graph. I don't know if you see it with the... Um, in pink, uh, you have the left parties. In pale pink, the populists. In hard pink, or almost red, the extreme right, those who do not abide by the democratic rules. You see that the populists who play the electoral game are uh, more on the left, and even more in blue on the right. So all that shows their share of the votes in national elections. But more interesting for us, maybe, is to look at their shares in European elections, because the same day, in 28 countries, now 27, you have the results, and it shows you the, the balance of um, electoral uh, dynamic. In the last European elections, only four countries had no populist radical right elected deputies, Ireland, Luxembourg, Malta, and Portugal. Most populist radical left parties were on the decline, but most populist right parties were in progress. And the, the little group, I don't know if you see ECR and ID, ID is... Uh, uh, the group uh, formed by identity and democracy, that's the hardcore of populist radical right, where you have the French national rally. And if you add populism of the left, of the center, and of the right, you have something like 230 elected deputies in the European Parliament today, where you have 705 on the total. So why this progression? That's what I'm going to see with you, structural and short-term factors for the European case. So there are many elements, and I'll go fast. The first one is what we call the post-industrial revolution, the, the passage to a service-based economy where knowledge, education counts. And there has been quite a decline and marginalization 
of the working class, manual blue collars to the expense of the middle classes, to the benefit of the middle classes. And that makes these working classes available. There is a political de-alignment from the left, and that helped the expansion of the populist radical right. The second is a value revolution, what we call the post-materialist revolution, post-World War II context, a value change, post-materialist values enhance freedom, self-fulfillment, critical mind versus first necessity means, and that makes more critical citizens. And then, of course, at the heart of the rise of these rights, you have the economic and financial globalization with increasing competition, economic, political, and the idea that you have now, the globalization winners, people who are skilled, educated, cosmopolitan, internationalized, and those who are the losers, who are or who feel threatened by globalization. And these are the people that the radical rights say they represent. The fourth element is a general crisis of representative democracy since the 90s with the transformation of party politics, the idea that they are more and more cut off from their bases, as they are state-funded, they don't care anymore. And there's a growing political disaffection, decline of party membership, of party voting, of political trust. In a country like France, when you ask people if they trust political parties, you have around 14%. In a representative democracy, that's quite interesting, a figure. And that's the opportunity for populist party who claim that they represent the people, but not the parties and the existing elite. And last, something that helped these parties is social networks in a globalized world. They have thrived on that, the social networks. So the political impact, that gives them a possible electorate, critical citizens, less dependent on parties, on new issues with new parties on the left, but also on the right, a silent counter-revolution, most of them being against these new post-materialist values, the rights of women, of gays, of minorities. And there are different varieties. I'll skip that quickly. In post-communist Europe, it's not exactly the same scene. They are more culturally conservative and more in opposition to ethnic minorities than to migrants, and at least until the refugee crisis of 2015. But what's interesting and what gave them a boost, it's short-term factors. The Great Recession of 2008 and the European sovereign debt crisis, the refugee crisis of 2015, the terrorist attacks in the name of Islamic fundamentalism in France, January, November 2015. The result is what has been called a populist moment or a populist turn, a fourth wave where the radical right populists are successful. Not all. There are countries where the populist radical rights haven't seized the opportunity. For instance, in the French-speaking part of Belgium, they didn't develop. It depends on the parties, and it depends on the other parties. But whatever their electoral success, these rights ob oblige the existing parties to reposition around their issues, immigration, law and order. They delegitimize the party in office. And brings about a new transnational cleavage, losers, winners of globalization, cutting through the left-right divide. And now I'll attack Le Pen and Zemmour. So I'll tell you about the history of the National Front National Rally, the electoral dynamic of the daughter of Jean-Marie Le Pen, Marine Le Pen, the electoral profile of the voters, and the challenger Zemmour. These are the two faces of the same phenomenon, what we call radical populist rights. So the French case is very interesting because it's a old party, the National Rally. It was founded in 1972. It started rising electorally in the 80s. It has been one of the most successful in Europe as a model for the other populist radical rights. But there is clearly a new dynamic with Marine Le Pen since 2011. She started a new de-demonization or normalization strategy, offering a more acceptable image of the party 
She has banned anti-Semitism. She presents herself very cleverly as defending democratic values, rights of women, rights of gays, Jews, and secularization against Islamic fundamentalism. So she says she is a rampart of democracy and not uh, the reverse. Now, does her party fit the definition of radical populist right? Yes, clearly. It's populist, anti-elite, I'll show you, authoritarian and nativist. And so is the newcomer on the right, Eric Zemmour. So it's their challenge, their fight we are going to study. Just to give you an idea of what I mean, when I say the electoral dynamic of Marine Le Pen's party, she took over in 2011. These blocks are the results of her party in presidential election, the first block, in uh, parliamentary elections, in regional elections, in uh, European elections, and in local uh, departmental elections. In all these groups of election, she does better than her father. And her record score was in the last presidential election of 2017. Just to give you an idea of what I mean, that means that in these presidential elections, in the first round, Emmanuel Macron, our president, got more than 8 million point six votes. She got 7.6. So he got 24% of the valid votes. She got 21.3. That's more than her father ever did in her first round. And in the second round, she lost. But she lost with almost 11 million votes. 33.9% of the valid votes and 22.3% of the registered voters. So it's her success. Now, I'm going to tell you about the profile of these voters. And it's conformed to the profile of other radical right populist rights in Europe. It's right-wing, it's populist, anti-elite, it's authoritarian, it's ethnocentric, and it's very different, contrary to what some people say, very different from the populist radical left embodied in France with Jean-Luc Mélenchon and the rebels, his party, Les Insoumis. Just here to show you that it's a right-wing party. In yellow, you have the proportion of votes for the party of Marine Le Pen, according to the placement of the voters on the old left-right scale, going from left to right. Well, you see that on the left, she gets a very small percentage of vote, 12, 6, in the middle, 25, on the far right, in the two last positions on the left-right scale, she jumps to 87% of the votes. While Mélenchon, it's the exact opposite. On the far right, he gets 1% of the votes. On the far left, 60% of the votes. So clearly, the left-right cleavage isn't dead. Now, what about their values? First, I said they were populists. That's in 2017. How the voters of Mélenchon, the extreme left, Macron, Fillon, which is the conservative right, and Marine Le Pen considered the elites, the political class. And I don't take the answers very much agree, somewhat agree, because there everybody is populist. I just take the people who say I very much agree. Political elites, they don't care. Half of Le Pen voters think that. 26% of Mélenchon, 15% of Macron. They are not trustworthy. 9% of Marine Le Pen voters, 34% of Macron, 18% of Mélenchon. Political class, they are the main problem. 62% of Marine Le Pen believe it. And they are only interested in money, 47%. So populism, anti-elite resentment is clearly the case. Now, what about the ideological profile? profile. I said they were authoritarian. That's the proportion who are in favor of restoring the death penalty that François Mitterrand abolished when he was elected in 19, 1981. Restore the death penalty, a quarter of Macron and Mélenchon voters, 74% of Le Pen voters. And the feeling that there are too many immigrants in France, 
32% of Mélenchon voters, 36% of Macron, 91% of Le Pen voters. And in the same way, they are against the European Union. Now, if you look below at the social and cultural profile, you see that education makes a difference. 67% of Marine Le Pen voters do not have the baccalaureate, which is the sésame to have a good position, to have a successful career. And 55% are blue collar, routine, non-manual, and 54% have a low income. So that's to give you a general idea of these voters. And now, what are the resources and what are the limitations of Marine Le Pen and her party? She clearly succeeded more than her father to expand and diversify her electoral base. I haven't time to develop it here, but she managed even to get the votes of a sizable minority of Jews, of gays, and above all, of women. And that's important because women represent more than half of the electorate. She ended what is called the radical right gender gap, the, the reluctance of female voters that plagued her father. For the first time in 2020, there was no more difference in the support of men and women for Marine Le Pen. And in the 2017 election, young women voted more for her than young men. Only the middle and upper class resists. Education is still a main divide. And although she has a better image and her party have a better image than at the time of her father, it's still seen by more than half as a dangerous, dangerous party for democracy, anti-system, a party one doesn't make alliance with. She hasn't managed to transform her electoral gains in political alliances. And above all, her weak point, only 28% consider she is capable to be a president of the, of the republic. So there is a definite lack of credibility. So what about the next presidential election? Total uncertainty. Before September, all the opinion polls predicted a duel between Marine Le Pen and Macron and that she would do even better than in the last presidential election. It's no more the case since Eric Zemmour entered the game. So who is Eric Zemmour? It's an interesting case. He, he was born in a Jewish family in Algeria. He is a journalist, essayist, writer. His last book is France Hasn't Said Her Last Word. He is not part of the political class. No party is trying to create one, reconquest, and Generation Z, Z for Zemmour. But he's had a flash ascent in the opinion polls, surpassing even Marine Le Pen for a while since September. He is absolutely a populist, authoritarian, a nativist candidate, so he fits into our definition of populist radical rights. But I would say he is even more radical than Marine Le Pen. He believes in what you may have heard about the great replacement theory, the idea that tomorrow Arabs and Muslims are going to take over in France. He is ultra assimilationist. He wants parents to give to their children French names, families to bury their deads in France. He rehabilitates Marshal Pétain, who was leader of collaborationist Vichy regime in World War II, and he is openly, even more than Marine Le Pen, with more nuance, for restoring death penalty. Less culturally, he is clearly anti-feminist and extremely conservative. So just to show you, these are opinion polls in the long run. And uh, the top line, I don't know if you see it there, yes, the top line is the votes for Macron. As you see, he is clearly the head of all the potential candidates in the next presidential election, around 23-24%. Now, there in blue, just below, it's the scores of Marine Le Pen. There were moments she did even better than Macron. But she has been going down up again, down, around 16, 17% these days. And now you see starts here, that line, in September, going up, 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 even above Marine Le Pen for a while, that's Zemmour. Now he is around 15 and in some even lower 
in some opinion polls. And the last line in blue is the conservative right candidates who won the primaries of her party, Valérie Pécresse, and she is going up. So we have now a very different game than last summer with uh, Macron ahead. But the three others, Marine Le Pen, Valérie Pécresse, and Zemmour, very, very close. That's the last opinion polls, mid-December. You see Emmanuel Macron, 24, Valérie Pécresse, 17, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, 11, Eric Zemmour, 15, now he is a little lower. And what's interesting is what would happen if one of these candidates qualified for the second round, because you need the absolute majority to be elected the first round. If it's the conservative right, Emmanuel Macron wins with 51%, Valérie Pécresse gets 49%. It's a tight game. If it's Marine Le Pen, Emmanuel Macron wins better, 56% versus 44%. If it's Eric Zemmour, it's much better for Emmanuel Macron. He has not yet gained the credibility. So just to give you a little more an idea of who are the voters of Marine Le Pen, Zemmour, today before the next presidential election. Well, if you look where they come from, that's the top line. It's how people voted in the last presidential election. You see that voters who voted for Jean-Luc Mélenchon, 59% will vote for him again. Those who voted for the socialist candidate, uh, they are going to vote for socialist candidates. Those who voted for Emmanuel Macron, they are going to vote for him. If you take the conservative right, they voted for François Fillon, 50% would vote for Valérie Pécresse, but 27%, around a quarter, for Zemmour. And Marine Le Pen, 60% of those who voted for her in the last presidential election will vote for her again, they say. But 28%, and now 25%, vote for Zemmour. So Zemmour takes votes from the conservative right and from Marine Le Pen. And now, if we look at the profile of their supporters. Well, gender is very important. Just look at the two lower lines. Marine Le Pen gets 14% of the votes of men, 18% of the votes of women. It's the exact opposite for Zemmour. He gets more votes among men than among women. And if you look at young women, it's 7% for Zemmour. They infinitely prefer Marine Le Pen, who has presented herself as a, a modern quasi-feminist, even if she isn't, candidate. Now, if you look at the age, you see that Marine Le Pen has her best scores among those who are active between 25 and 60%, uh, 60 years of age. Eric Zemmour, he gets the elderly more. And if we look at the, the, work, the classes, you see that only Marine Le Pen gets a substantial share of the working classes. So the result is that both candidates, Le Pen and Zemmour, have assets and limitations. He is a newcomer. He's fresher. He's far more radical. He's a brilliant speaker. And he hasn't that extreme right heritage that plagues Marine Le Pen because of her father. But maybe he is too radical he is not considered as having a presidential qualities, presidential stature. He gave the finger to a woman in Marseille who disagreed with his ideas. He has not really a program except uh, ban immigration and replace. He lacks a working class base. He really antagonizes women, especially young women. And there has been a lot of violence in some of his meetings. In the last meeting where he announced his, uh, he was candidate in Villepinte, there was a group of young activists of SOS racism. And their T-shirts together formed the slogan, No to Racism. They were severely beaten up by the followers of Zemmour. So just the fact of saying you are against racism is uh, dangerous in France today. As for Valérie Pécresse, well, she was chosen by the primary of her party. She had a very good score, so she has a kind of political legitimacy. It's a woman. First time a woman would be the presidential candidate on the right. 
She has a political experience. She is more credible than a Zemmour or a Le Pen. She was head of the region Ile-de-France, former minister of higher education and budget. She is tough on immigration law and order, even not as much as Zemmour, economically liberal, far more than Marine Le Pen, and less conservative culturally than Zemmour. So the game is completely open. And we must be careful because we are still very far from the election. Many voters do not know for whom they're going to vote, one out of two. They're uncertain. And the final candidates, we don't even know because to be candidate, you need to get 500 signatures of elected representative in 30 departments. And we don't know if Eric Zemmour, who has no party behind him, will be able to make it. So we don't even know if he will be candidate. He has till March 18. Last one must be very careful. We can discuss it more with opinion polls, especially online polls, which the only ones one do now with COVID and their horse race format. There are other methodologies, not asking for whom you will vote, but giving a score to the candidate. And then Pécresse comes first. That was a, another survey. In pale blue, you see for each candidate, those who say either she or he is excellent, very good, or good, and in red, bad. So you see that ahead of all come Valérie Pécresse and Emmanuel Macron. And you see very, very low Marine Le Pen. And Eric Zemmour is the very last. So nothing is certain for the moment. And I'd like to reach a conclusion. The danger of populist radical right parties in a democracy is that they say they are the Democrats. They, they say they represent the people, that they are more democratic, more because they push away the elites as non-representative. But especially the populist radical rights, they have a truncated conception of democracy, purely electoral, and an exclusionist vision of the people, us and them, all the others, the immigrants in particular, <clears throat> people of another religion, they push aside. They don't want. And they do not defend the liberal values, which are the mark of a democracy, of a liberal democracy, the rights of minorities, the rights of their position, checks and balances, free press. And they polarize <clears throat> the political debate around their ideas around immigration and law and order. And every day, they work at delegitimizing the other parties and all the other intermediate bodies. So they are active, even if they don't win, they are changing the terms of the political debate. So what can be done? A long time ago, William Downs made a very nice scheme of the kind of strategies mainstream parties can have faced with populist parties, and especially radical rights. So for him, you had two options. One was to disengage. The other one was to engage with them. What he meant by disengage is no affair with them. Either you ignore them, but it's difficult when they get 11 million voters like Marine Le Pen, or you put legal restrictions, you change the electoral rules, or you isolate them. You put what you call a cordon sanitaire. You say, with these parties, we will have no alliance. No electoral alliance, no parliamentary alliance, no governmental alliance. You don't want coalitions with them. That's one way. The other way is to engage with them, to co-opt, to copy their politics, or to collaborate with them at the level of the parliament. So all that has been tried. <clears throat> There is really no miracle solution. First, it depends on the type and size of the parties and the context. But some strategies are worse than the others. Some always fail or backfire. The first one is fighting them with only moral arguments, the good against the bad. That doesn't work. Politics is proposing concrete solutions to concrete problems, not just saying that they are the bad guys. That doesn't work, and even victimizing them can turn in their favor. The second strategy is to overbid, imitate them, such as proposing even stricter immigration policies. <clears throat> and that 
doesn't work. That's a very nice paper showing that it doesn't work. And even more if it's the left that does that. Imitating them, taking stricter or proposing stricter immigration policies, for instance, gives these parties legitimacy. And in the end, as Jean-Marie Le Pen said, voters will prefer the original to the copy. Last, the error is the last error is to put them at the heart of the political game, to pretend that you only have a fight with them. That gives them an importance that they do not have. So it's difficult to fight with them. And I'd like to quote Cass Mude. We should not prioritize the fight against the far right or populism. We should instead strengthen liberal democracy. In essence, the far right or the populist radical right is the symptom not the cause of the decline of liberal democracy. <clears throat> Conclusion. Nothing is inevitable in politics. And so many things can happen in France in the coming month before the presidential election. Other terrorist attacks, new COVID wave, a new variant after Omicron, a recession, climate catastrophes. That can widen or close space for the Rassemblement National or for an Eric Zemmour. And we don't even know who are going to be the candidates. But the decisive factor on which you win or lose an election will be turnout, the differential rate of turnout. In the last regional elections a year ago, it was a catastrophe. One voter out of three went to the polls. And Marine Le Pen, to whom the opinion polls predicted a very strong uh, return, had a very bad score. So we have a total uncertainty today on who are going to be the second round challengers. Probably Emmanuel Macron will stay first, but who is going to come in position number two? Valérie Pécresse, Marine Le Pen, Eric Zemmour? We do not know. And the last element will be the attitude of the mainstream left and right. If they run behind the ideas of the populist radical rights, that's going to help the radical right. So now you have a theoretical frame and some empirical data to form your own opinion about these parties, maybe understand them. Understand also that France is a magnifying glass of what's going on in Europe, in Western Europe, old established democracies. But if you want to understand populism in India, Pakistan, uh, Israel, all over the world, uh, Brazil, you need to take into account the specific context of each country. That's just a general line. But as far as radical right populism go, maybe the danger today is not populism. It's more generally the expansions of far-right, authoritarian, fundamentalist regimes all over the world. And populism are, above all, the signal that representative democracy is dysfunctioning. And I'll stop there in order to leave some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for this insightful lecture, and thank you for joining us in this session. Uh, so we'll start taking the first group of questions, and we have quite some here. So the first question is, how do you explain that far-right populism is against the corrupt elite, especially represented in a supranational democratic institution? I didn't hear, I, excuse me, I didn't hear the question. Okay, how do you explain that far-right populism is against the corrupt elite, especially represented in a supranational democratic institution, European Union. However, this swing uh, participate in the EU institutions. Uh, the, uh, would you like to? It's a complicated answer? question. It's yeah, a, it how do you explain that they are against the corrupt elite? Yeah, I mean, yes. uh, the question, like, we can uh, reward it in a different way. Uh, how do you see, like, the future of EU in the uh, light of the rise ah, okay. of populism in Europe? 
Do you want me to answer immediately? Uh, I actually can. I can. I can provide you with more questions as well. So you know, this is the first group. The second question here is like, the, uh, what is the impact of division among the left wing? Uh, will increase the chances of the right wing to win the next presidential election. Is this going to increase the chances of Macron's or is going? Is this going to uh, increase the chances of the right wing? So there's a mm-hmm. real severe division in the left wing itself. So how is this going to affect the future okay. of the presidential elections? And uh, there is another question from Dr. Aisha al-Basri as well. Um, let me just uh, go through it. Um, you can... Hold on. You you can you can start answering, and I'll just take the the next group of questions. Yeah. Okay. So um, the idea that the elites are corrupt and that the European Union bureaucracy is corrupt and uh, that's something that helps these populist rights, but they have a very ambivalent attitude towards Europe. Roughly, radical rights in Europe consider that the EU is the example of Mm. corrupt, distant elites. Yet, they use the European elections and the European Parliament as a tribune, because it's sometimes easier to get elected representatives in the European Union, so as a tribune, and they use the money of the European Union. And the National Rally in particular, but other parties too, have been... uh, tried, there have been filed lawsuits against them because they use the money of the European Union to pay their own assistance. Mm. So it's a very complex, you can turn against them the accusers' accusation of corruption. Several parties are under that. Mm. But the future of uh, the European Union, of course, uh, depends on, largely, on the success or failure of these rights. For the moment, even though they have managed these populist radical rights to organize in the group identity and democracy, they do not represent more than a small minority in the European Parliament. But you're right, uh, they use uh, the European Union as a symbol Mm. of everything that's going wrong. So it's it's a game, it's a bras de fer, as we say, between these radical rights And the European Union, they use it when they need it. And most of the time, they consider the European Union and its policies even more Mm. as the open door on immigration and all the the threats that immigration poses. Now, the question about the division of the left, yes. The division of the left, it's a full catastrophe for the left. There have been uh, attempts to reunify, but in a way... Emmanuel Macron in 2017 uh, collapsed, helped the collapse of the left and of the right. But for the moment, with the candidate uh, Valérie Pécresse and the primaries of the conservative right, Les Républicains, they have managed to get a beginning of union together. The left has not. It is totally, desperately divided. And that's going, of course, to help uh, Emmanuel Macron and all the other candidates, uh, but especially Emmanuel Macron, because he's the one who has the most chances to be uh, there. What's going to, on the other hand, might go against Macron is the fact that because of that very division of the left, there is a total demoralization of left-wing voters, and in particular, of the center-left voters who voted for Macron in 2017. And the result is that many say that if there is a duel between, it was between Marine Le Pen and Macron, maybe they won't even go to the polls. And that that helps to the total uncertainty. Uh, That could turn against Macron if they do not vote for an Emmanuel Macron in the second round facing Marine Le Pen. So you see it's ambivalence. Thank you for the answers. Uh, there's another question from Dr. Aisha al-Basri. Uh, Eric Zemmour has founded the Reconquest with the main agenda of cleansing France from Arabs and Muslims. Don't you think that uh, France is downplaying this uh, fa- fascist agenda by uh, describing Zemmour as a radical right-winger? This is the question. Um, 
what do you call, how do you want to call him? I mean, fascism doesn't help. I mean, if you go back to the history, we are not uh, the time of Nazis, we are not in fascist Italy. He is a extreme right, I would say, yes. More, but it's a populist extreme right. He can be both. Mm -hmm. He is populist in the way he frames his idea in an anti-elite, anti all the other parties, anti-mainstream parties position. Uh, his proposals, the cleansing, the great replacement, are more radical than any other candidate of the right. So in that sense, he is more to the right than any other candidate. Mm -hmm. And it, you can call it a radical right, an extreme right, an extremist agenda. Yes, yeah, I, it doesn't help to label it fascist. It just confuses things. Uh, but more radical than all the other candidates, he is. We have questions here from the audience as well. Dr. Abdul Wahab will have a question. Uh, thank you, Professor May, for uh, uh, this interesting focus. I think uh, uh, the focus on France as a uh, uh, as an arena for uh, for right wing populism uh, is quite interesting in that. Uh, it raises an important question uh, about France's vulnerability uh, to this type of, uh, of anti-democratic activism, uh, since I think France was one of the earliest countries which has witnessed this success of the extreme right wing and uh, uh, the extreme populist right wing, let's put it this way. And now also it has also uh, uh, populist uh, 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 left as well. Now, uh, uh, my, uh, I think my point is that uh, why is France uh, so vulnerable? And I, uh, I would uh, point to some uh, uh, guesses on my part. Uh, I think France uh, uh, has, has looked very insecure as a, uh, a, a republic, as a culture, uh, uh, and it has also been, uh, as a colonial power, it has been, uh, unlike the British, very narrow-minded, very, uh, uh, let's put, uh, uh, very um, uh, uh, brutal. And it was also that, I think, uh, part of its insecurity. It was not, uh, it didn't compare very well to the British colonialism, which was, as a colonial power and also as a democracy, was more tolerant of cultural differences. France, uh, as a republic, as a revolution, has been very uh, uh, intolerant of uh, variation. In France itself, the way it has imposed unity, cultural unity. Uh, I think this is one, uh, one point. France has also been, uh, uh, as a culture, insecure against the predominance of the English language and the way it wanted to preserve its culture. But I think another uh, maybe contributor uh, is the way the left has turned, not only in France, but around the world, into a, a, an Islamophobic uh, uh, entity which has many uh, common points with fascism, uh, or at least right-wing uh, extremism. Uh, and uh, also, I would say that a populist uh, left-wing in France has also undermined, and in, England, and in Britain as well, the way the Labour Party has turned populism populist, even when uh, uh, the left is not uh, in collusion with the right wing in, in being anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim uh, anti in particular, uh, opposed to cultural uh, 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 pluralism, it also undermined the center left uh, by this regard. So I, these are just conjectures. Uh, and thank you for the interesting uh, paper. Thank you for something which is not a question, but a whole line of interpretation of what's going on in France and what's going wrong in France. 
And I would say with you that there's a strong insecurity in France. I mean, maybe it hasn't uh, accepted uh, to be no more the glorious France of before. But what you say, of course, about the fact that the French colonialism was far worse than British colonialism, uh, it's true that there is intolerance, it's true. Yet, when you compare the level of tolerance of minorities, well, France, if you look at the, in, its, in its depth of the population, it's not more intolerant today than the other democracies in Europe. It, it's more complicated. Uh, there is that past, there is the difficulty to face that past. We have a lot of debates today about decolonization, it's, it's cutting through the lines of the left-right cleavage, but it's not enough to explain why we have a Zemmour. And uh, also, it shows, somebody like Zemmour shows that part of the population, but a very small minority, has never accepted the loss of the French colonies. Uh, Zemmour is exactly on that line. But still, today, he is quite a minority. I mean, you cannot say that uh, the France uh, is behind an Eric Zemmour. He is a completely delegitimized by a large majority of the population. The thing which is uh, also very important and which that you point at is the, the fact that the left has changed. But I would say that the left in France is divided. I would say that the left in France has turned into Islamophobia. On the contrary, the more you are left-wing, the more open you are to Islam, minorities, living together with people of different religions. So it's a little more complicated. But I would say there that we have that tradition of secularism, la laïcité, which can be today is dividing the left. Some are on the line of an open conception of secularization, where the first thing of la laïcité is that everybody has the right to practice his or her own religion, and that it's done to help people of different religions to live together in peace. Others, a minority, on the left, far not always a minority, have a comeback uh, conception of secularization, which is very anti-Islam. But you cannot say that for all the left. I would say that the problem today is that in a country which has a very high proportion of migrants, a very large Muslim population, there is on part of the population fear of that population, Muslim and immigrants, and on a large part of the left, uh, defense of the rights of these minorities, vibrant anti-racist organization, and on another part of that left, attachment to a rigid and a combatant conception of secularization, which can uh, turn against uh, migrants and Muslims. And some people have called it, I'm thinking of a, a, a researcher called Bobro, He'd said, uh, he would say that for some people, secularization, la laïcité, is mainly anti-Islam, with a fear of the dynamism of that religion, the second religion in France today. But I wouldn't generalize to all the left as Islamophobic, certainly not. Thank you. Uh, we have two questions here from our online audience. So we'll start with Kofi. Would you like to... I, you know, I ask your question directly, please. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Meyer. Um, so I actually have two questions. The first one is that we have in ne the Netherlands and France two examples of a populist radical right party finishing second and then facing a challenge from a fellow party on the extreme right. Um, and it cost Gert Wilders in his last election with Baudet gaining. And then it might cost Marine Le Pen. And so I'm wondering, how do you think that plays out? Can these parties coexist and stay relevant? Or will one of them eventually have to dissolve? And then the second question is a little off of your central topic, but I noticed briefly in your PowerPoint, you had um, listed the five-star movement, I believe, as a left-wing populist um, party. Yes, central. And, 
Yeah, because I I was I had always seen them as yes. ambiguous because they they have that environmentalism, but yes, anti-immigration as well. So maybe central. So I was wondering if maybe you could uh, explain your characterization of them so that I could understand clearer. Because I, I depending on who you ask, they might place the five star movement in a different place. So I wanted to get your explanation, please. Okay, thank you for for these very nice questions. The first one, yes, they are common points uh, between uh, the Netherlands and uh, and France with the idea that you, you often have two competitors on the populist radical right side and that divides them, yes. If Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour united their forces, they would be extremely dangerous because she has a social working class base which he hasn't. Uh, she has the women which he hasn't, but more women than he hasn't. But that's ideally Actually, they hate their guts. They won't get together. So you haven't the right to just make an arithmetic addition and say, ah, if you add Marine Le Pen plus Zemmour, it's 30% of the voices. No, because some people who can vote for Zemmour because he hasn't the extreme right history uh, of uh, the, the, the Front National would never vote for Marine Le Pen and uh, vice versa. Some people who would vote uh, for one would never vote for the other. So it's more complicated. But for the moment, it's a factor of division. And strangely enough, Zemmour has managed to make Marine Le Pen look almost center radical right. He has uh, attenuated her impact. It's very interesting. But for the moment, I definitely don't see them siding together side by side. But you never know in politics. You know, Napoleon III used to say in love and in politics, you must never say never. And I would certainly use it for that. Now, you are absolutely right about the Five Stars movement. It's a neither left nor right movement. Uh, it would be better to call them center populism. In the beginning, there was more left wing uh, essence in it, and it has gradually faded away. Uh, so it's really uh, something I put it by commodity, but you're absolutely right. It's not a left-wing movement, no. You can put uh, Podemos, Syriza, Les Insoumis, that's left. And I haven't had the time to develop that, but it's very important to say and see that radical right populism and radical left populism are very different in their ideology. Uh, there has been an old theory from the time of Nazism. It's the horseshoe theory, saying, ah, the extremes meet. Well, no, they don't meet. The ideas of uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon and of uh, Marine Le Pen, they can be both against Europe. But on the side of Mélenchon and of the radical lefts, it's against the Europe of the grand capital, big business and neoliberalism. While on the side of the radical rights, it's against Europe in the term of nativism, anti-immigrant positions. And so let's not mix up the left and the right and the Cinque Stelle, they're somewhere in between. Uh, we have another question from Keith. The floor is yours. Sure. Well, thanks very much. And thank you, Dr. Meyer, for the really interesting talk. Um, my question is perhaps a bit broad, but uh, I'm, I'm curious uh, about your, your assessment. And you mentioned and you, you discuss how the, the radical left is, is not nearly as popular electorally as the radical right. So I wonder if you could briefly comment on, on what the reasons for that might be. Do you think that it's a delegitimization of the left following the fall of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the socialist countries? Because in Eastern Europe, which I study, that is definitely the case. So I wonder if you could comment on that in uh, the Western European context. Thank you. Thank you for the question. You're absolutely right. Uh, the radical left, uh, and not only in France, uh, they have uh, much uh, lower scores than the, the radical rights. The populist moment is really for the radical rights. Uh, I would say uh, two things. First, uh, they have nothing to offer. They have no vision really to offer after the collapse of communism. There's something there which plagues them. They haven't managed to propose a new deal, which would be a left-wing new deal. The second thing, uh, in a world of globalization, with the migration flows, the fears focus on immigrants. And these rights, they, sorry, these lefts, they are not anti-immigrant. And that makes a difference. I would say that what fuels the success of the populist radical rights 
is that they have seized that issue of immigration, minorities, the other, which the radical left does not. And it's in the honor of the radical left, but it's their weakness. That's where the radical rights thrive. It's really there the difference. So we have uh, the last two questions from the social media. The first question is, what are the reasons behind the rise of populism in the French political discourse, despite the fact that France has a democratic infrastructure that identifies freedoms and the limits of radicalism? Uh, the second question might be having... I didn't understand the end of that first question. Okay. All right. The three last words. Okay, the few last words is like uh, France has that democratic infrastructure that identifies freedoms and the limits of radicalism. Mm -hmm. And the second question that has the same nature, what are the main factors behind the rise of populism in Europe in general and the US? Thank you. So I, I would say that yes, of course, uh, France has a democratic infrastructure. And it's because it has a democratic infrastructure and a democratic tradition that Marine Le Pen is not in office, that Marine Le Pen has hardly any uh, elected deputies in parliament. Every time they get fantastic scores in the first round, they are barred in the second to the point that even, uh, even if it's uh, today more difficult, there in the last, uh, before last regional elections, for example, they should, they should have won two regions, the National Front at the time. Well, there was an um, alliance between the left and the right against them in the name of democracy. So that democratic structure uh, prevents them from uh, ac access to power and government for the moment. Uh, but there is something there which, that because of that democratic tradition, the party of Marine Le Pen, in spite of all her strategies of de-demonization, is still perceived as a danger for democracy by one person out of two. So uh, they have still they are still perceived as an anti-democratic and an anti-system party because of that uh, tradition. Two, the factors in Europe and in the the in the U.S of these populist uh, radical rights. Well, in a way, it's all the, the factors I listed before. It's the idea that the working classes, uh, those who work every day, feel abandoned. It's uh, the idea that citizens have become more critical. The idea that there is a growing gap between the parties and their leadership and the bases. And it's the financial, the, it's the economic and financial globalization, which brings in both countries on both sides of the Atlantic a need for protection and for making the country great again. What the country, what uh, uh, Donald Trump on one side, uh, Marine Le Pen or uh, Eric Zemmour on the other say, they say in the world of today, we must close the borders. We must stop immigration. We must make the US, France great again. Uh, it's the fear, uh, the economic insecurity and the cultural insecurity that feeds the success of these parties, of these leaders on both sides of the Atlantic. Thank you. One last concluding question. From Dr. Thank you, Schmidt. thank you very much, uh, no, Dr. Nona, for this amazing presentation. I would say, as usual, uh, uh, I have, in fact, uh, two uh, small questions. The first one: To what extent do you agree that uh, uh, Eric Zemmour, as a political phenomenon, is a creation of the media? Uh, to what extent the French media are really responsible of cre yeah. creating the Zemmour phenomenon? The second mm -hmm. one, I would like to hear you about what is, uh, uh, in your opinion, the potential explanation of this uh, still outlier in the European Union, like Air uh, Ireland, Malta, Luxembourg. Why we don't see the uh, rising uh, uh, right-wing populist parties, or at least having anti-immigrant parties in these countries. Thank you very much. Thank you for these two uh, questions. Uh, the first one, yes, partly. Medias have not total power. 
but they have helped very clearly the electoral ascension of an Eric Zemmour, and not all the media, specific medias. It's those who are controlled by the, the businessman Bolloré. It's, it's uh, televisions and uh, medias like CNews, where he has been uh, for years a debater. That, that's uh, right and far right medias that have helped the development of an Eric Zemmour. In the same way uh, as you had that in the US, uh, when you had uh, Fox, uh, the Fox News helping, you have now a type of media which is cut off from the mainstream media and that clearly uh, are conservative or neoconservative and helping the electoral ascension of somebody like Zemmour. That's absolutely clear. It's not enough. You also have a context of uncertainty, of insecurity, but the media add to that. It's a, uh, there's a very good book that has come out by a, a researcher called Frédéric Matonti, M-A-T-O-N-T-I, explaining why we have become reactionary. And it's exactly that. It's an analysis of these media, the journalists, the so-called experts they invite, always on the same side. There's something going on there which is helping people like an Eric Zemmour, as it helped Donald Trump in the US. Some people only see these chains and medias. They're only exposed to that discourse. And that helps somebody like Eric Zemmour very much. Now, the second thing there, it's more difficult, Ireland, Malta, the outliers. You see, when you try to study any political phenomenon, you need to hold two threads. The demand side, what are the voters, what do they want, what are their needs, what are their aspirations, and the supply side. And you can have a fantastic demand for populist radical rights, but no party, no leader capable to embody it. So I would say that's one of the elements. I would say it should be different for every one of these countries. So I, I won't enter the detail, and I'm not a specialist of these countries. But I would say that one of the main factors there would be uh, the lack of a, a party, a structure, and a political leader capable to uh, answer the demands for populist radical rights. The same, a very nice case of that kind of problem is uh, Belgium. In the part of uh, Flanders, there have been very successful uh, radical right populist parties. In the French-speaking part, Le Wallonia, there hasn't. Why? There was a party, the National Front, and it never succeeded. It was divided, it stayed as a groupuscule. So one needs to look at the political supply, the political leadership, the political agency and the political resources on the supply side to understand why in some countries it never comes out. But also, I would say, be careful. For a long time, one said there'll never be um, a populist radical right or an extreme right in England. They have that tradition and Ireland. There'll never be one in Germany because the Nazi past is too close. There'll never be one in Portugal or in Spain because it's so close from the end of fascism. Well, it's coming. Even in Portugal, it came in Germany with AFD. Maybe one day it could also happen in the four outliers that you mentioned. Uh, nothing is ever certain in politics. I would like to conclude today's lecture by thanking you for joining us today. Thank you for this very insightful lecture, and uh, it was an honor really to have you here today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for inviting me and for the questions. <laughs>